everybody. Welcome to Washington, D.C. Uh, glad they didn't threaten snow again. So thank you so much, Lori. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank Ron Painter, the entire board, all of the leadership of uh, NOB, both for welcoming me today and for your leadership on this critically important issue. Let me thank everybody in the room for making our public workforce system such a rousing success. Frankly, I should be applauding you for the honorable and innovative work that you're doing on the front lines every day to make your local economies successful, to ensure that the people in your communities have the education and the tools that they need to find good jobs. On Friday, the Labor Department reported that unemployment for the month of February was 7.7 percent. Now, that's the lowest unemployment rate that we have had since December 2008. Now, it's a good number. I wouldn't be popping any champagne corks necessarily, uh, but it reinforces our confidence that the worst of the Great Recession is now over and that our economy is continuing to grow. Without question, we've come a long way from the cataclysmic days of late 2007 and 2008 when the greatest economy in the world suffered a tremendous blow. February marks three uninterrupted years, three uninterrupted years of private sector employment growth with a total of 6.4 million jobs created over that period. And there are other signs of economic vitality. Retail sales are up. 73,000 jobs were added in professional and business services last month. Housing is rebounding, providing a shot in the arm to construction employment. That's last month, construction had its largest one-month jobs increase since March of 2007. Also, the Dow reached a record high last week. And while that's encouraging news, I don't think it would be presumptuous of me to say that the typical client of our American job centers is not going to be able to go off into retirement based on their thick investment portfolio. We still need to do more to make sure that the recovery continues and that it works for everyone. Corporate profits are high, but for more than a decade, wages and incomes for most Americans have either been stagnant or declining. The truest measure of our economic success as a nation is not just abundance, but widely shared prosperity and a robust middle class. An, an economy that grows not from the top down, but from the middle out. That's America at its strongest, and that's what President Obama has called his North Star. And he knows, I know, you know, that skills development for America's workers is essential to getting us there. In his State of the Union address, the President outlined a clear and ambitious agenda to invest in the middle class and grow our economy. The first pillar of that plan is to make the United States a magnet for jobs. And he laid out several steps, specific steps, for how we can do it. New manufacturing partnerships, investments in clean energy, a commitment to upgrading and rebuilding our infrastructure, rebuilding our housing sector, encouraging fair trade, and restructuring tax incentives so that we don't reward companies that move jobs overseas and instead we invest in companies that create jobs right here in the United States of America. But the President also noted that no jobs agenda can succeed without successful workforce investment, or as he put it, to equip our citizens with the skills and training to fill those jobs. President Obama understands the fundamental facts that you're living each and every day that more than ever, what Americans earn depends on what they learn. That skills are the leading edge of economic development for communities across the United States. That when multinational companies make citing decisions, they're looking for communities that can generate a pipeline of talent capable of producing 21st century goods and services. And that globalization and technological innovation are making skills and training an even more urgent imperative than ever. American workers are ready. They're willing. They're able. No question about it. 
There's no challenge they shrink from. There's no skill they can't master. They just need government to be a reliable partner. They need us to invest in their potential. That's what President Obama intends to do. He continues to make increasing the capacity of our community colleges a top priority. Just a few weeks ago, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina to visit Central Piedmont Community College where they're doing extraordinary things to build a state-of-the-art workforce. They built one of the most comprehensive community college employer partnerships in the nation. Local businesses, and let me say, there's deep involvement from the Local Workforce Investment Board have given input on curriculum development, they're serving on advisory committees to monitor training programs, they're engaging other employers to work with CPCC, and most importantly, they're hiring the graduates of CPCC's programs. The Department of Labor has provided some of the money that makes CPCC's innovative approach possible. And we've made similar investments at institutions around the country through our trade adjustment Community College to Career Training Program, or the TACT program, as we call it. The TACT program is based on a very simple, common sense idea. Community colleges and workforce boards must partner with local companies and business associations to find out what skills those companies need workers to have. <clears throat> We've already awarded a billion dollars under this program in recent years, and very soon, we're going to release another $500 million through a solicitation for grant announcements. But there's no reason that skills-based learning can't start even before higher education begins. Citing the German model of graduating high school students with the equivalent of a community college technical degree, the President proposed in the State of the Union a modernization of American high schools to assure their graduates have the technical skills they need to get, keep, and succeed in the jobs of the 21st century. If post-secondary institutions can partner with local businesses to align their curricula with the needs of employers, why can't high schools do it right now? Let's give our young people a leg up as early as possible by designing high school classes in disciplines that will lead to good middle-class jobs. Now, of course, these kinds of partnerships are nothing new to the people in this room. They're at the very heart of what our workforce investment boards do. Now, right before I went to Charlotte, I was in Cleveland, where I visited ArcelorMittal's steel plant. And let me tell you, this isn't your grandfather's manufacturing. It's a high-tech, sophisticated operation that produces 3.8 million tons of steel each year that's used primarily in American-made cars and Whirlpool washing machines. Every aspect of production is run by intricate, computer-driven systems that are operated by highly skilled members of the United Steelworkers of America. How did they get such productive workers? Well, you know the answer to that. They partnered with Employment Connection, which is Cleveland's Workforce Investment Board, which has been instrumental in ArcelorMittal's success. Together, Employment Connection and ArcelorMittal collaborated with area community colleges to create a program that trained individuals to meet the specific needs of that plant. To ensure that Employment Connection and the rest of our workforce boards nationwide can continue their outstanding work, the Obama administration is pushing aggressively for the reauthorization of the Workforce Investment Act. Now, we have built this sturdy infrastructure that we have 15 years ago, but it's time to reform it, to make it even more effective, and to use it as a launching pad for a 21st century economy fueled by the best prepared workers in the world. It's a mistake for a piece of legislation that is so important to the future of America's middle class to be silently passed along on a year-to-year -year ad hoc basis. Congress needs to act, and to do so in a way that builds on the workforce system's strengths and successes, like the one that I saw in Cleveland, and honestly, like those I'm seeing around the country as I visit workforce investment boards, like those represented in this room. We a reauthorization must address the system's challenges, it must promote, inno promote innovation, and it must proliferate the best practices. 
and we want to streamline the system, but it must be done in the right way. President Obama has laid out five key principles to strengthen the public workforce system in WIA reauthorization legislation. First, we must streamline and improve services. Our state and local partners need flexibility as they work to ensure easy access to clear information for job seekers, workers, and employers. Second, the public workforce system should provide a true one-stop shopping experience. Regardless of any barriers to employment, every American should have access to the full range of services that they need to succeed in their communities when they access the workforce system. Third, our economic development strategies must be regional and they must be industry driven. To put it simply, a one-size-fits-all approach isn't going to work. This is why business-led, locally controlled and delivered workforce services have proven so effective by focusing on employer-based solutions to regional workforce gaps, we can simultaneously strengthen burgeoning industries while preparing workers for labor markets that may well stretch beyond one town or one county or one state. Fourth, we must ensure strong accountability throughout the public workforce system. This is true for every system that is funded by the American taxpayers. We need reliable, consistent metrics so that workers and employers and my Labor Department staff know which services and training providers work best. And the American people must feel confident that they are getting their taxpayer dollars' worth. Lastly, our public workforce system must promote innovation and replicate best practices. As with most, as with most things these days, we're going to have to do more without the promise of getting additional resources. So we need a process of continuous improvement and innovation. We should provide incentives for creative solutions in the public workforce system and disseminate information about successful strategies so that other communities can benefit from that knowledge. One of the bills that's been offered is the Workforce Investment Act of 2013, and I think it offers a solid approach that implements many of these principles. It creates a community college to career fund, a workforce innovation and best practices grants program, and it will place a greater emphasis on the attainment of industry recognized credentials. By contrast, the Skills Act, which is headed to the House floor for a vote this week, addresses some of these principles, but falls far too short on many others. For example, it fails to guarantee funding to address the needs of job seekers with barriers to employment. This means in all likelihood that numerous populations with specialized needs, veterans, people with disabilities, disadvantaged youth, migrant and seasonal farm workers, they may not receive the range of services they need to find a good job. Some of those populations might not be served at all. And the Skills Act doesn't do enough to assure that key stakeholders' voices will be heard, nor does it succeed in promoting continuous innovation or the identification and replication of best practices. When people ask me to describe the nation's workforce investment system, the best answer I can give is there's no one answer. It depends on where you are and what local conditions demand. The whole system is predicated on the basic truth that Milwaukee is different from Macon and the strategies that work in Tucson may not make sense in Toledo. There's no cookie cutter for successful skills development. It's all about local leaders tailoring solutions to local economic conditions and nearby workers. It's a grassroots system, a bottom-up solution, not a top-down mandate. This is your system, yours, your local employers, and your local workers. The grassroots character of the system is what makes it work. So too, the fact that it brings all stakeholders together in pursuit of shared solutions to common problems. And the fact that local businesses, the people who create the jobs, 
have a seat at the table is equally instrumental to the system's success. What we must do is to modernize and streamline and strengthen the public workforce system that has done so much for so many through our 2,700 American job centers serving roughly 33 million participants each year. There is a right way and a wrong way to approach reform. The Skills Act is the wrong way. Speaking of the wrong... Now, speaking of the wrong way to do things, let me say a few words about the so-called sequester. There's a word you don't hear in your local community very often, unless one of your friends got stuck on a criminal jury and they get locked away with horrible food and no television in a hotel, right? Well, that pretty much captures the mood around sequester here in Washington. These arbitrary, across-the-board cuts, which began taking effect at the beginning of this month, are just another obstacle in the path of our economic recovery and the President's efforts to strengthen and expand the middle class. Overall, the Labor Department is going to lose more than $3.1 billion in funding. But let me just say, this isn't a story about dollars. It's about workers trying to secure their families' economic future. The sequester will cut WIA and Wagner Pizer funds by $165.7 million, which means that more than one million fewer people will receive the job training and job placement services they need. Thousands of dislocated workers, disadvantaged adults, disadvantaged youth are going to be left without access to the skills development and intensive assistance that you and I know can help move them into good jobs. This is no way to get our fiscal house in order. It's a choice made by one side in Congress. Now, the President's offered a balanced deficit reduction plan that asks the wealthy to do their fair share but doesn't cut the services middle-class families need. It is hard to justify choosing sequester instead of asking millionaires and billionaires to contribute more by closing unproductive tax loopholes. This is the wrong path for workers. It's the wrong path for employers who need a skilled workforce to grow their businesses. It's the wrong path for the American economy. Now, we're going to do our very best to minimize the impact on American families who depend on the Labor Department's work. We're cutting back on lower priority activities and searching for efficiencies everywhere we can in order to maintain mission-critical programs. We'll work our hardest, just as we have for the last 100 years, on behalf of workers and their families. But I want to be honest with you. There isn't much I can do. The sequester is a butcher's cleaver, not a scalpel. Now, the economy is better than it's been, but not where we want it to be. More importantly, it's not as strong as we know it can be. A rising, thriving middle class is the engine of American economic growth. So we must do everything possible to build our economy from the middle class out, not from the top down. The President understands that building workers' skills is a critical ingredient in that formula. He's counting on us to do more and to do it better. But no one is counting on us more than ordinary Americans looking for work and employers who need skilled workers. They're our customers. They're our partners. Our job, yours and mine, is to give them a workforce system that serves their needs and helps the American economy to achieve everything it can. Thank you for everything you do every day. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you today. Thanks very much. Thanks.